Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tom Dusterberg. I'm a senior fellow here at the Hudson Institute. Uh, thank you to you in the audience for joining us and those of us, those of you who are watching us online. We're here to talk about uh, the uh, um, presence of uh, uh, China in uh, Africa, some of the development aid that is being provided to Africa, and some of the consequences of how they structure uh, that aid. Um, it's been in much in the news uh, of late. Um, just in the last few weeks, the uh, foreign minister of uh, China, the new foreign minister of China, uh, made his first trip um, to um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, stopped in Angola and uh, was followed a little bit later by the Russian foreign minister um, and later by uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. There's a good deal of controversy about um, the form of aid that's being uh, given to some African nations and um, some of the controversies that result from that. So we're going to explore some of these. And we have um, in the, the, case, the case study of Angola. So uh, I'm going to introduce our panelists, uh, and we'll get right to it. And we're fortunate to have uh, my friend Rafael Marquez de Moraes, mm -hmm. who was an investigative journalist um, from Angola who founded um, a um, uh, a uh, online web journalism site uh, called Maka Angola. Um, he's been active in tracking down uh, some of the problems uh, that have uh, been occasioned by foreign uh, participation in the, in the Angolan economy. He wrote a book on blood diamonds. Um, he's uh, um, written extensively on uh, the Chinese presence in uh, Angola. He's well known here in this country. He's been honored uh, a number of times uh, by the Na National Association of Black Journalists with their, uh, uh, an award from them. He's uh, won the Civil Courage Prize from the Train Foundation. Uh, in 2011, Human Rights Watch awarded him a Helmut Hammett grant for his contribution to freedom of expression in Angola. Some of our friends from the National Endowment for Democracy in 2017 honored him with their uh, Democracy Award. Um, we're also pleased to have from our, uh, uh, our friend uh, Janae Cox from the uh, National uh, Republican Institute. She's the Regional Deputy D Director for Africa. Uh, she's uh, overseen a number of projects uh, in more than a dozen countries in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, including when she, f she first came to uh, uh, IRI uh, as the Administrative Director of the Consortium for Elections and Political Process Strengthening. She's also uh, been at Freedom House, uh, and we're pleased to have um, someone of her expertise. She's written about the politics of Angola uh, and, is an ex and other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Finally, uh, my colleague Nate Sibley. Uh, Nate is the uh, uh, director of our kleptocracy initiative. He's been active for a good number of years in tracking down um, nefarious activity in, uh, uh, around the world. Um, by kleptocrats. He's a champion of human rights. He's written extensively and appeared extensively on, in the U.S. national media uh, trying to draw attention to some of the problems uh, of kleptocracy and human rights abuses around the world. So we're going to start um, with uh, Raphael. Uh, Raphael, uh, with a little bit of help from me, uh, he's published an article on the odious debt uh, um, in Angola, which refers to some of the ways that the Chinese development assistance has been abused um, in uh, Angola. So Rafael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom. And good afternoon, everyone. And um, 
it's quite interesting that um, just before uh, this presentation, the news was circulating in Angola uh, about it uh, because it had already been published in the portal of uh, the Hudson Institute. So there is a great interest uh, from Angolans about the Chinese role in the country. And today I'm here just to talk about China's role in providing loans to Africa that has come under increased scrutiny. Uh, much of the funds earmarked for development projects have either ended up in the bank accounts of corrupt officials or have had nefarious strings attached. And another major problem that we have faced in Angola is that uh, much of the reconstruction projects done, uh, some of them are no longer working or need or in need of great repair, like the railways, the um, housing projects, and others because of the poor quality of construction. Um, And so what we also need, uh, the case of Angola, basically it's a case study because uh, it shows how billions of dollars were diverted by un corrupt Angolan and Chinese officials and business people. And uh, that has not been accounted for and there hasn't been much uh, justice. Um, and one prime example is the sanctions uh, slapped by the United States under the Magnitsky, Magnitsky, Global, Magnitsky. Magnitsky yeah. Global Magnitsky Act uh, against the three former Angolan officials. Um, but not of the greediest of the kleptocrats who was in charge of the whole operation with China. And I'm talking about... Um, the former head of the National Oil Company, Sonangol, Manuel Vicente, who was uh, responsible, the chief negotiator with China, and responsible for the oil for reconstruction contracts. Uh, he's now sitting in Dubai, where also the daughter of the former president is signing along, and uh, he's not on the sanctions list. And that. Uh, to Angolans, that's kind of problematic because he was the driving force of the relationships with China. And to exclude that man and then um, pin on the others who had uh, lesser relevant roles is quite, um, quite a mystery to many of us. Uh, the other... And just recently, we had the visit of the Chinese foreign minister uh, that provided another loan of $250 million to help Angola uh, improve its internet infrastructure um, and expand high-speed broadband. Uh, and the statement by the finance minister of Angola is that this is the first loan that actually um, would be beneficial because it does not have strings attached to it. And the strings that have always been attached to the contracts with China is oil. Um, but again, it's not clear uh, if this deal, um, as in the previous deals, is just for the benefit of Chinese companies and Chinese workers, uh, in a sense that much of the loans provided by China had to be spent by Chinese companies and had to employ mostly Chinese workers. And that's how we ended up until 2014 with more than uh, 250,000 Chinese workers in the country in a very short uh, period of time. And the question is, did Angola did, uh, had any risk assessment about this loan? That question has not been answered. Um, and again, there is also the fear that this project of broadband might be a Trojan horse uh, in terms of um, surveillance and data collection and industrial spionage. We don't have much, but Angola uh, remains strategic in that region of Africa, uh, especially because of its vast uh, mineral wealth. 
and the And at the moment, we have uh, Angola's uh, debt to China is over $21 billion, so making it the biggest African client. And this represents 40% of Angola's entire uh, foreign debt. Uh, and the main problem with this is that half of the Angolan budget every year now is to pay the debt to China. Uh, and so very little is then spent on infrastructure, health, education, and other services. And uh, as a result, just three years ago, Angola ran into fiscal trouble and had to turn to the IMF and its tough love prescription to balance the books. And again, the question is, why is the government taking more loans from China? Um, and Angola claims to have now a um, budget surplus. I'm not good in economics, but it sounds kind of strange to have such huge debts and uh, extremely poor services and still have a surplus. But it's something economists also can take on Angola and study it. Um, but what is important here also is just to highlight the history of corruption and state capture. Uh, and one of the ways uh, deals with China were made in the past was by setting up uh, shell companies in Hong Kong by the former head of Sonangol and uh, Sampa, his Chinese accomplice, that was the go-between the Chinese government and the Angolan uh, government with official sounding names. For instance, the national oil company Sonangol, and then a company set up in Hong Kong. Several had the name of Sonangol as well, China Sonangol, um, holding China Sonangol International, and so and so. But these were simple vehicles for uh, channeling public money into their private bank accounts. An estimated $1.5 billion uh, meant for the government as payment for selling oil to China. And again, just to explain, uh, Sonangol would sell oil to China, Sonangol. And the head of Sonangol was, at the same time, the head of China, Sonangol, Manuel Vicente. And the money sold to China, Son uh, the, the oil sold to China, Sonangol, never made it back to the state coffers. And China Sonangol ended up investing in Angola with Angolan money for national reconstruction. So in that sense, we lost twice. Um, and Sampa has been in jail in China, and Manuel Vicente uh, is around uh, Dubai with nothing happened to him. Uh, the two other members of Dushanto's uh, triumvirate, uh, there were three important people that were essentially Dushanto's henchmen, Manuel Vicente, and two other generals, Copelipa and Dino. Uh, the two generals have been indicted for corruption, particularly for deals with China. But they were not uh, directly responsible for managing Sonangol or, or even the relations with China. Uh, and this highlights the dilemma the current president is facing uh, and the many failures also of the legal system in Angola, which has not been reformed. Um, for instance, the indictment against the, the two generals, half of uh, the indictment, which is 80 pages, is about how Manuel Vicente is responsible for all the deals with China. And then somehow, halfway through, Manuel Vicente's name is, disappears from the indictment, and these two generals are indicted who were not directly responsible for the relations with China and for signing on the oil contracts. Um, and similarly, similarly, the same happened to the United States. that imposed sanctions on the two generals and not on Manuel Vicente. Some financial investigators say the only explanation is that President Lorenzo is covering for him. 
uh, Angola is still uncovering the scams and paying the price. Uh, another example is that a $10 billion capital loan from China, Sonango, from China to Sonango in 2016 uh, was recorded in the National Bank of Angola ledgers. But to date, we don't know what has been done with that money and where actually that money ended up. Uh, and as President Dushanto's mandate was coming to an end, he then appointed his daughter, Isabel Dushanto's, the fugitive billionaire now, uh, to head uh, Sonango. And it was more or less at this time of transition where these $10 billion went and accounted for. Um, and so, and we've been um, discussing much um, about um, the obscurity of the Chinese loans to Angola. And we have estimated that much as half of the national debt owed to China did not end up in public projects, but in private bank accounts. Uh, the phenomenon now described by the IMF as odious debt. And why should successor governments uh, have to bear the burden of servicing this debt that had no benefit to the public. Um, and also, there have been many alerts to the creditors, especially to China, about the illegal nature of some of these dealings with Sampa and uh, Manuel Vicente. And uh, so that's why one of the main issues at this point is to demand uh, forensic analysis of this debt and to see really what ended up being spent for a public uh, infrastructure in Angola or for the public benefit and what ended up in private accounts. So what has ended up in private accounts should not be paid uh, by Angolans, but by those who hold those funds. And that's what I in a nutshell, have to to tell. Well, it's quite a quite a story, but un unfortunately, it's probably not um, something that is limited to um, uh, the experience of Angola. But one can legitimately ask the question: um, What are other nations doing? For instance, in just the, the, this most recent instance, where the Chinese foreign minister graciously offered to build a 5G system in uh, Angola using probably um, um, Huawei as, as the <laughs> contractor. Uh, did the United States or any of the other Western nations try to do anything to uh, offer an alternative? So, Janae, you've been uh, working this sort of thing for uh, 20 years. Um, what should the United States and its allies be doing uh, to try to counteract uh, some of some of these nefarious practices. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Appreciate that. Um, yes, I think the U.S. definitely could be doing a lot more than it has done um, in its past and recent um, history. I think starting right where you kind of led us. I think, uh, for example, I think the U.S. could certainly better leverage the Build Back Better World initiative, otherwise known as the B3W framework. Um, it's diver it has diverse development finance tools to provide viable, I think, alternative solutions for some of the needs plaguing Angola uh, that are prime investment targets by the Chinese government, such as um, IT and cybersecurity and building the 5G network. Um, for example, um, so far um, it's been noted that under the B3W, the U.S. Has, the US has recently signed a contract to develop a $2 billion solar project in four southern Angolan provinces. Um, but the framework itself is broader than that. And I think targeting additional resources and support in certain key areas, such as telecommunications, would be something that I think the US should think about and reprioritize, um, especially as it comes to Angola. I think in addition to the B3W initiative, there are a couple of other areas where I think the U.S. could be doing more with Angola. Um, one, um, 
Angola is an important security partner for the region. Uh, we regularly rely on Angola to engage, especially with um, recent clashes um, in security and peace operations in the Great Lakes region. I think capitalizing on that partnership, uh, we need to show that we're also interested in other areas of investment and engagement in Angola. I think the U.S. should certainly prioritize increasing high-level engagement, although there have been some visits. It's not as regular or as frequent as it needs to be. I mean, the U.S. Secretary of Treasury is visiting South Africa this week. They're not making a stop in Angola. I think that's something that uh, the U.S. should certainly do and shouldn't miss opportunities for further engagement. Um, U.S. development assistance, although often comes with strings attached, as does the Chinese assistance as well, um, although many partners don't like to take U.S. money because the strings require them to improve on areas of govern governance, transparency, or even human rights. Um, we, I do think, though, regular engagement should emphasize the partnership that could come between Angola and the U.S., thereby directly countering more of a transactional nature linked with, I think, Chinese investment. So continuing to build that, as we've seen in many other places, the U.S. is a partner. It's a partnership to work on advancing many common agreed points, not just outliers. And think lastly, I'd like to add, um, you know, I think we all know that democracies perform better ec economically. And I think it's critical that the U.S. increase its development assistance, uh, prioritize support to strengthen governance, accountability, and transparency. And without these measured steps to kind of decrease state resource, cut corruption, and set up strong institutions, the long-term needs of Angolan citizens will not be met. Uh, the U.S. has a current plan to invest up to $200 million in governance centered around energy and other social infrastructure and service programs, but it's missing investments on core democracy and governance work, really working on maybe fiscal, and tra fiscal transparency, budgeting processes, local center or local centered governance programming, uh, things that are really in the public interest. I think those are areas for further refinement and things that the U.S. can be doing. Okay, I think in the general discussion we'll return to some of these factors, but mm -hmm. let's let uh, Nate, uh, who's had uh, quite a bit of experience um, tracking um, kleptocracy, um, Sometimes it's very hard to track down exactly what's happening, as Raphael uh, explained here in Angola. But do you see a broader pattern here um, that you would uh, that this is emblematic of? Yeah, sure. And thank you for inviting me to join today, Tom. Uh, congrats to you both on an excellent paper. I do commend it to the audience, and anyone read, please do read it. It sets out what's happened in Angola uh, very succinctly and clearly, because it is a complicated situation. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and, it, and it sheds light on something which, as you say, is not unique to Angola, though. But Angola is probably, um, you know, there, there are poster child countries for uh, some of the problems that can arise from Chinese uh, infrastructure investment. I think Sri Lanka is the one we usually think of. Angola is, is kind of right up there um, for the reasons that you, you were talking about. Uh, it's a particular honor to, to speak alongside you, Raphael, as well. I know you've been through so much in your in your various travails to try and make Angola, let's say, for a more open place, and um, you know, uh, followed your work for many years. Um, I'm actually going to um, take a slightly different tack um, first, and uh, talk mostly about sort of begin talking about China. Um, firstly, because uh, I'm not an Angola country expert, I defer to all questions on that to Raphael. Um, uh, but also because I think it's sometimes unfair that we focus in on corruption in Angola uh, in these cases when actually. In all these cases, China is, is the kind of senior partner. Um, and so we have to look at, at the system in China, I think, first to understand what has happened when it has moved out into the world um, with these vast sums of money to, to try and make the world, as it says, a better place through infrastructure investment. Um, and they are, very, they are very aggressively and very openly promoting uh, what they see as an alternative uh, economic development model um, to that offered by traditional sort of co Western concessional lenders like the IMF. Uh, that grew out of their own experience, beginning with the sort of economic reforms from the, the late 1970s, one aspect of which was local officials and high-ranking officials throughout the Communist Party uh, were tasked with promoting growth uh, at any cost, basically. That was the only metric they were sort of uh, judged by, uh, by Beijing. 
And what this did in China was it opened the door to a, the, the emergence of a, a uni, of quite a unique prevailing form of corruption there. Um, the, the scholar Yuan Ang talks about this in her book, um, probably, probably the best uh, explanation of it, of it um, China's Golden Age, and she calls it access money. Um, when we think of bribery, we think of you know, a local official um, getting in the way of entrepreneurship. Uh, you, know, you need to give me a bribe if I'm going to give you a license to open your shop over there. Whereas in China, this access money uh, refers to these sort of cozy relationships that grew up between these local uh, you know, growth-obsessed officials uh, and the new entrepreneurial class that was emerging um, throughout the, the 80s and the 90s. Uh, and so what this led to was a kind of state, sort of party-led, debt-driven infrastructure projects, massive real estate projects, um, things that all um, you know, officials would help entrepreneurs with opportunities rather than get in their way um, you know the the other you know the the alternative example being India, where that that low level kind of petty corruption is much more prevalent, and it's perhaps why India has not tracked. There are many reasons, of course, but has not tracked with China in terms of of its economic growth. Um, so the the but what I'm trying to say is that the the, the problem is that China's mirac sort of what it often says miraculous economic growth through this economic development model. Um, also concealed a lot of corruption. Uh, it skewed the incentives of officials uh, who were handing out these opportunities, and it encouraged uh, sort of wild risk-taking by these emerging tycoons. Um, and so what China uh, you know, brings to the world when it, when it tries to promote its economic governance model through the Belt and Road Initiative or various other channels uh, is a pretty you know, um, you know, successful model for economic growth. It's not necessarily one that encourages economic development, uh, which is actually what most of these countries need. Um, and indeed, uh, what we see is some, some very common uh, and consistent corruption risks uh, that emerge in, um, certainly in Angola, but in, in pretty much any country that's uh, joined the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative or the various other channels for, for Chinese investment. Um, the first is straightforward profligacy. Um, China's uh, policy banks, when Xi Jinping came to power, um, these, are, these are not like banks, like development by banks like we have. They are there to enact, um, you know, the interests and the, the political agenda of the Communist Party. Um, they were ordered to inject, you know, what at this at this point in our numbers, in perhaps trillions of dollars, uh, into countries uh, which, uh, you know, had extremely poor rule of law in some circumstances and exist significant existing corruption risks. Um, countries that, you know, Western concessional lenders like the IMF wouldn't lend to, or as we as we've talked, you know, talked about. Um, you know, often attached quite quite stringent conditions to that investment. That was for a good reason. Uh, it wasn't just you know out of a sort of abstract concern for democracy and human rights. It was often just to make sure that the uh, the projects didn't fail. Like you know, because uh, I think a lot of the stuff that's a lot of the investment that's been made in Angola, it, it turned out to be quite shoddy. Like the roads and then things, they, they sort of broke down after a few years. There were four, I think there was really like four football stadiums they built uh, in Angola. They're no longer usable uh, or accessible. It's just stuff like that. Not to mention, of course, in the oil industry. Uh, and, and the, you know, the way the production has sort of pl plummeted there because of, of, of the way. But anyway, so these, these, they poured tr you know, trillions of dollars around the world into countries that were basically not able to abs absorb that level, of, uh, organically kind of absorb that amount of money. The second thing is, and he talked a lot of this, about this, Raphael, um, these, these agreements are often uh, extremely opaque. Uh, and I think it's, I can't remember, I, like, I was trying to look it up before, and I can't remember who, who did it, but they, I think it was a Peters Institute, I might be wrong, and I apologize to whoever did the study if I'm wrong, but they studied sort of hundreds of um, Belt and Road Initiative agreements that they managed to get their hands on, um, and found that every single one had what they called unusual confidentiality clauses. Um, you know, so the, the, the recipient government is not actually allowed legally under the terms of the contract to, to disclose the terms of the contract to the public in the way that, you know, uh, we might expect here in the US or in Europe, to, you know, journalists would expect to see some of the terms of, of these things, even if they can't see everything. Um, and of course, that dark space, that, that, that agreement creates enormous, um, exactly what you were saying, uh, space for bribery, embezzlement, fraud to grow in that, in that space. Um, it also conceals, and I was intrigued by what you were saying about the shell companies, um, because one of, one of the interesting things, one of the shifts in China's development investment over the years has been from, from sovereign to sovereign lending, more to sovereign to sort of quasi-governmental organizations and private companies. Um, so what they'll do is they'll, the, the, the agreement is made with the, the recipient government and the policy bank in, in China, but the money is actually given to a private company or some sort of, you know, like not, not quite part of the government or obscurely sort of maybe part of the government. And that, what that's done is, is actually obscure the, the scale of the debt. It, it, it keeps it 
off the public books uh, in terms of often, you know, if people have like FIA type laws, you know, they're not able to, um, you know, if it's with a private company, they don't see that money. But what the Chinese do is they build in um, liability guarantees. So if that company sort of fails or whatever, um, then the, the public, the treasury in that country is still on the hook uh, to repay the money. Um, and it, it, some of the best work on, on this stuff has been done by a group called Aid Data down at William and Mary University. Uh, and they found that th they found they were able to find there's probably more 385 uh, billion dollars in hidden debt that debt that had been hidden in this way around the world. Um, and then finally, I, I, I would say that you know a lack of accountability for those involved. Um, you, you've talked about this the, the way that people who negotiated these deals have not been indicted, sanctioned, whatever. China itself has no. Uh, it has a, it has a foreign bribery law. Um, it has, to my knowledge, never enforced it. It's been around, it's been there for 20 years, I think. Um, not one, you know, in a way that U.S. firms operating overseas are always petrified of, of being caught under FCPA. Chinese companies don't need to worry about that. Um, and they also, because they're backed by these policy banks, which are you know, extensions of or com the state-owned commercial banks, which are extensions of the, the Communist Party, they don't suffer the kind of reputational uh, financial risks for engaging in fraud and corruption that you know Western competitors uh, would do. Um, so one of the big, biggest Chinese uh, construction companies got disbarred by the World Bank, um, I think it was like 10 years ago or something, for rampant fraud in, in projects in Africa, I, th I think. I can't remember where, exactly where. Um, but it just carried on, because you know, whereas a, a Western construction company, that would be pretty fatal um, financially for them. Uh, and then um, I'm sort of um, going over time a bit. Um, just want to talk a bit about the notion of sort of debt diplomacy. Um, I think with China, uh, in the case of Angola as well, I'm not, I'm, there is a healthy like, scholarly sort of debate about whether China set out to deliberately entrap people or not, um, or whether you know, its, its interests were primarily commercial. Um, I personally think it's a bit of a mix. Um, but the outcome is the same, and that's because China has, has never been a concessional lender. Um, and I think the, the terms, uh, what you've seen over the, over the time of Xi Jinping's office is terms went from being um, more concessional at the start, they were lent by the policy banks, and more and more, it's the state and commercial banks that have been lending on commercial terms right up until sort of 2017, 2018, when the Belt and Road peaked. Or 2019, sorry, it was before the, uh, the pandemic, wasn't it? Um, and I think we're now entering a sort of dangerous new era where the, the, the original concerns uh, were with Belt and Road and other, and other investment channels uh, were about what is happening with all this money. The, the US is losing influence. China's just like, Taking over the world with money, uh, you know, there's all these corruption risks. Now we're entering the sort of second stage of the Belt and Road, and um, uh, you know, in a, in a period when China itself is facing economic headwinds, the Chinese public and uh, Communist Party leaders are sort of tired of all the rampant debt and overspending, and how that translates to to dealings with uh, Belt and Road partners or recipients uh, is something we should we should be concerned about. I think we're in a dangerous position where they could either refuse to renegotiate debt resulting in default, or more, more likely, I think what will end up happening is they do re renegotiate, but they but on, on stiffer terms when it comes to acquiring sort of strategic assets and things like that. Um, I want to just really, really, really quickly, just three things, because I've gone over my time a bit. Um, and I, I just about what we should be doing to support uh, people like Raphael in, 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 in places like Angola. Um, the Biden administration has, of course, uh, prioritized fighting corruption, uh, President Biden identified it for the first time as a, as, a, as a core national security concern last year. But it does involve a dilemma for them, um, because when you take, take this out into the world, uh, it's actually quite a confrontational thing. And if you can't be sure that you know, imposing global magnitsky sanctions on a leader uh, will result in democratic transition, or pro-Western transition to another government, uh, what you run the risk of is actually just driving that country further into China's uh, you know, influence. Um, so I think that's why they sort of, but what we can be doing is, is being opportunistic and uh, with, with those sorts of sanctions. I, I'm glad that they, they, they did uh, place those, uh, those three people under global magnitsky sanctions. And I, I would join your call for, um, uh, what was his name? Um, Vicent. Vicent. Yeah, Manuel Vicent uh, to, to, to also uh, be designated. Um, the other thing is um, we, could, we could do a bit better tra financial transparency here in the US. Some of the things we're asking countries around the world to do to fight corruption, um, like rooting out shell company abuse, we still actually haven't quite got those over the line in this country yet. Um, and of course, when you get kleptocrats like Isabel dos Santos, quite often their money is washed through the US financial system. 
it's a good place to catch them because then we've got jurisdiction and we've got the resources to go after them. So if we, we give law enforcement these tools to do that, that would be great. And then finally, I think the most important thing of all we can do is continue to support um, uh, investigative journalists like Raphael uh, and civil society groups, um, not only through, through funding and resources and training with, with um, you know, groups like NED, uh, National Endowment for Democracy, who I see as well represented here today, um, but you know, making sure our own countries are, are safe havens for them if they get into trouble. Um, you know, making sure that they can't be sued by their home governments uh, for defamation uh, when they want to write, publish a paper like this, you know, <laughs> um, naming names and shaming people. So those are three of the sort of things I would think we should do. Okay, thanks, Nate. If I could follow up on, um, thanks for the, um, um, your explanation of sort of at a macro level, the Chinese approach to lending money and development aid um, uh, and the extent of this is so big and the problems with the uh, Chinese debt, um, especially in Africa, are so large that mm -hmm. there, there are fears expressed by the IMF and others mm -hmm. about another debt crisis. But uh, the concept that Raphael um, surfaced here of odious debt um, is, is trying to perfect that in international law, would that, would that be a response to um, not only what the Chinese are doing, but uh, they're not the only ones who uh, have dealt with um, um, corrupt regimes in the past. Is that something that we ought to pursue to try to uh, get fully entrenched in international law? Yeah, I think so. So as I understand it, this is the idea that, you know, money that's not spent, you know, by, in the way it was supposed to be spent under terms of the agreement that was funneled into Hong Kong shell yeah. companies or whatever, you know, should not really be fully, fully um, considered liable if, if the person paying it was, was complicit in the, um, um, I think that's certainly something we, we, should, we should be looking more into in terms of international law. These things are difficult. I'm, I'm sort of a, some of my anti-corruption friends are very sort of, internationally minded, they put a lot of, they set a lot of store in the sort of the UN Convention Against Corruption, they want the International Corruption Court. I tend to think, you know, in, in, the, lot, these things are very well intentioned and lofty, but when it comes to enforcement, uh, it's the US that stands out uh, and kind of has the resources and often the political determination to do these things. I would love to see the US, I would love to see an independent audit of, of you know, all the dealings that Angola's had with China, particularly over, over the oil, as you said. But I would also love, in the short term, uh, rather than trying new, new sort of initiatives in international law, I would love for the US to, f to focus fire on um, the, the corruption that has gone on in Angola and try and uncover where those assets are uh, and seize them, and freeze them and seize them, repurpose them and send them back to the Angolan people. This is a, this is a slightly new area. Um, uh, of, and, and, you know, they could well be used then to service the, the debt to China, which, you know, I don't think Angola can just throw up its hands and say, we don't owe you anything, right? It's, it's not, the world doesn't work that way. Uh, but this is quite, quite a new area for the US, the seizing assets um, you know, and returning them. We, we saw it just uh, last week. In fact, it was announced uh, right here by the head of the Klepto Capture Unit who's, uh, at DOJ, who's going after Russian assets everywhere. He, they passed a law in Congress saying that we're allowed to um, uh, send money that's seized from Russian oligarchs uh, back, to, back to support Ukraine. So um, this is an area that the U.S. government is really interested in developing, and I would love to see it. Broad I would love to see it broaden beyond those those big ticket items like Russian oligarchs, though, um, because I think that would generate enormous goodwill in Angola. Like, correct me if I'm wrong, but okay, Janae, would would you like to respond at all to um, suggestions uh, Nate has made? Um, and one of the things he um, uh, articulated was uh, that Chinese. Um, um, strategy is not only a purely economic strategy, it's a strategy of selling a whole different political slash economic system that it claims is superior to the Western model. Is there, are there ways that we should be trying better to counter that sort of uh, strategy by China? Um, yes, so I think there are certainly ways 
that the U.S. can attempt to counter and should counter that type of strategy. I think Angola is not the only case study where this conversation could be had. I think it's several different places in sub-Saharan Africa, but we're here today to talk about <laughs> Angola specifically. So yes, absolutely. I think the need to be um, targeted in the U.S.'s approach and engagement, how it's supporting and really working to better and build stronger institutions and a better culture. I think what we find best is, you know, or what we're seeing in some instances that, you know, Chinese investment has gone to maybe training programs, right? There's a new um, party school in Tanzania that was built by uh, the Chinese government and is training political actors, for example. Mm. Um, we're seeing many trips being taken by those on the continent to China for training and learning experiences. And I think that's an area where the U.S. has traditionally also done a lot of programming, but maybe it's time to kind of increase that investment and engagement. And again, I think through targeted programming, using partners that are well known and respected that can navigate a um, sensitive political context to provide training and support to not only civil society, but other partners and beneficiaries in Angola, we might be able to help change that narrative as I think the US has generally done, which is you know the soft diplomacy route and engagement through programming. So I think there are avenues um, in addition to the bigger funding kind of institutions and frameworks out there to invest in lar larger infrastructure, but you know, social services, um, delivery infrastructure, local governance, those are all areas where I think the U.S. can really excel in, in terms of its support that it provides. Okay, Rafael, would you like to uh, respond or elaborate on any of the points that? Um, uh, I would like just to, to say that the most important issue remains the ability for Angolans and Africans for that matter to hold their governments to account. And also foreign governments because many things can be missed uh, even in with the U.S. goodwill. Mm -hmm. I remember when I came in last December for the civil society, U.S. Africa Civil Society Summit yep. and this uh, $2 billion loan for um, solar project in Angola was mentioned as well as a great example of the US commitment to Angola. And I raised the issue that the company, the Angolan company actually benefiting it, is now a company that holds the, monom the monopoly of uh, getting all the contracts from the president without public tender. Mm -hmm. And has now received more than $7 billion in contracts without tender. Uh, so, and that is problematic because sometimes the goodwill, if no proper research is done, or if we get into this race where uh, China and the U.S. are competing for, um, you know, a foothold, uh, then we might end up paying a higher price because either way, corruption becomes the norm. I, I mentioned um, uh, at the outset that um, there were a series of foreign ministers passing through yes. uh, Angola and other places in Africa, including the Russians. Um, what in the world were the, was the Russian foreign minister doing in Angola in the current circumstances? Well, Angola has a historical ties with Russia and the Angolan military depends almost exclusively on Russia for weapons. Uh, our army is uh, trained in Russian weapons and uses uh, Russian weapons. And so that's why it's uh, quite uh, difficult for the president to navigate. And that's why we need clarity in Angola's foreign policy uh, on how to deal with China, Russia, and the United States. Because what does not work is to try to please the three of them. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> Angola must decide <laughs> with whom to side. Uh, 
uh, whether through historical ties or uh, looking towards the future. Uh, because we've had experiences with the uh, three countries, historical experiences. So, and it shouldn't be difficult for uh, President Lorenzo to decide what to do. Uh, the main problem is that he came uh, fully energized in combating corruption. And in the end, is corruption combating him? Because um, he did not reform the judicial system and the state administration to enable it to work with a degree of transparency. You know, uh, he basically, threw some of his own uh, party members under the bus, but kept some of the most notorious incompetent individuals in government. And goodwill does not replace competence. Competency. Is that the correct word? Yeah, competency. So, and the lack of skills in this government is just um, uh, astonishing. Uh, one example, for instance, um, and that reflects foreign policy as well, because uh, the president doesn't know where to turn. Uh, at the moment, we don't have an attorney general. Uh, his mandate expired in last December, and uh, it has to be through elections uh, held at the magistrates' council. And among the magistrates, they choose three no names that they send to the president, and the president has the sovereign power to pick one of those three names. Um, what the Attorney General did was, last December, was to convene the meeting of the Magistrates Council and say, well, the President said, I will, he will renew my mandate, therefore there's no need for elections. But the law says that, and then we have the Attorney General of the country saying, well, there is no need for laws. <laughs> so, and then we have the President of uh, the Supreme Court who Every single day, there is a new scandal about the individual. Uh, and he, the latest accusations against him, and uh, someone has been arrested who was in his uh, security detail, was selling uh, Supreme Court decisions. Uh, sentences, uh, decisions, I, I think it's the correct term. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Supreme Court decisions. And why is it important? Because all the cases of uh, government officials, what we call the who have privileged uh, forum, I tried at the Supreme Court. Uh, ministers, generals, uh, governors, they all tried at the Supreme Court as the first instance. Mm -hmm. And uh, suddenly the Supreme Court became this most powerful institution that replaced the old generals oligarchy and this corruption right and left. So, and one issue we have been doing in the country is to, and I've uh, been consistently writing about it, is a focus on the judiciary. If we don't have a functional judiciary, if we don't have reforms in the state administration, we can be talking about all sorts of things. Corruption will increase because the system is open to abuse. Uh, so that's why more than helping journalists, uh, I think what really is important for international organizations to do is to have a look af at these institutional uh, problems that really are an impediment to the functioning of the state, and then try to see how to help. Um, one prime example, uh, the Supreme Court has organized a visit of all the judges to Portugal to learn how to write decisions. And they've just started on the 3rd of February. Um, in light of all the scandals that have come forth with the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, it could have been better for the Portuguese to cancel the visit as a statement that we need to resolve these issues. But that has not happened. So that's where we have a problem. Once the government does not find legitimacy at home, it tries to find abroad. And it's a constant struggle 
on how to find the balance between what we do on the ground and how uh, external relations impact on uh, that push. Jedi, is that something um, help with um, improving the judicial system? Is that something that IRI, NED, Freedom House, or the US government can be helpful with? Uh, yes, I do think that, especially with the judiciary, um, um, several years ago, I think I had worked on a project that was supporting like the Bar Association in Angola as an entry point. Um, wasn't maybe direct, but I do think there is a variety of different programming, whether it's with the judiciary, whether it's with other institutions to build and support their response um, to kind of governance issues as well as you know, the need for citizens also to have a voice, right? So um, whether that's working with civil society or other actors, I think across the board in Angola, we would say institutions on the supply side as well as the demand side, civil society and other organizations, media and whatnot, all need capacity development, right? They need resources financially. They also need the technical assistance to really be able to be more effective um, across the board. And I think having that targeted approach, looking at ways to engage, although it's, it's an environment that can be difficult and challenging to work in, there are pockets where organizations such as IRI and others and those supported by NED, let's say, can engage. And that's where I think kind of doubling down on that investment I think would be really helpful. The US, it's been a while where we've seen um, significant investment in that sphere in democracy and governance support. And I think that's maybe an avenue we need to rethink, right, and, and where it is. I mean, Angola is kind of, uh, it is what the third largest um, trading partner to the United States in Sub-Saharan Africa. So it isn't insignificant. It's a strategic partner. It's a strategic place where especially our investment needs to go how it's conducted is, is something else. I think there have been in the past recent history several programs on anti-corruption. I don't think it's probably gone far enough. There's so many needs in terms of just institutional building as well as platforms for citizens to engage, holding their leaders accountable and increasing transparency at all levels. So um, I do agree with, with Avi. OK, thank you. Um, we have perhaps a few minutes left, and um, I'd like to open it to questions from the audience. Do we have a microphone? OK, sir, uh, could you just tell us who you are and uh, a succinct question? <clears throat> Hello, I'm Doug Burton. Uh, it'll be a challenge to be succinct. <laughs> I, I, I'll try. Give it your best. Sir, uh, <laughs> fascinating presentation. I don't know if you uh, track China uh, investments in other countries. Uh, Epic Times is interested in Nigerian-China uh, relationship. Now, do you see parallels uh, between Angola and uh, similar kinds of debt traps that China is working in uh, Nigeria? Okay. Well, let's take three more and then we'll go with them. Um, maybe yeah. one, one more, yeah. then we'll do them, answer them seriatim. Uh, right here. Uh, hi, uh, Dave Peterson, uh, director of the Africa Program at National Endowment for Democracy. Um, uh, you know, Raphael, uh, when I uh, saw you in Luanda uh, last year, uh, you were talking about this um, uh, judicial uh, uh, reform, and I think uh, you know you're um, spot on that um, uh, this sort of institutional reform is. I think critical uh, to fight uh, c uh, corruption and lots of other problems uh, in Africa, um, and uh, you know this meeting is about uh, China, and so I'm wondering, you know, what kind of nexus there might be between institutional reform uh, and China. I mean, uh, uh, we're looking at Russia a lot these days, you know, and. Uh, Russia doesn't really seem to be too concerned about rule of law or um, uh, you know, institutions. Uh, they're a, a bit of a, a rogue actor in, in, on the continent. But in the case of China, uh, it strikes me that the Chinese might have a little more incentive to 
um, you know, if, if forced to, uh, sort of play by the rules and, and that uh, strong institutions uh, might be in their interest. Is there a convergence there, you know, where uh, the Chinese can be uh, brought on board, uh, you know, to, um, you know, be more transparent, uh, you know, to, um, uh, you know, somehow um, engage with, uh, you know, I mean, this, the, the um, uh, effort, the process to get institutional reform is obviously enormous. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering uh, what opportunities there might be Let's, yeah. let's take those two questions. Yes. We're starting to run right. out of time. And perhaps on the, on the first question, um, uh, if it's maybe not, but, if not but, Nigeria, you're, you're involved in a think tank in Senegal, I believe. And yes. You know what's going on there in Zambia a, and other places. There is a similar pattern in many countries with, uh, with the way the Chinese provide the loans. Uh, in the case of Nigeria, I don't know what kinds of deals are done in, with the oil sector, but definitely there is a difference between um, how the oil sector in Nigeria works and how the oil sector in Angola works. Uh, in the case of Angola, there was just one man that controlled all the operations and had no checks on him. And that's what I explained about Manuel Vicente. He was, easy, uh, was able to have all those kinds of agreements with China, uh, basically without uh, the National Assembly or the Parliament, even the President knowing. Uh, and in Nigeria, it's a little bit different. So it's just to say these are different cases, uh, and one has to look country-specific. In the case of the next, there is a nexus in terms of institutional reforms in China and uh, any other country that goes to invest uh, in Angola. The first one is that, be it in Europe, in the US, or in China, everyone is looking for a successful story in Africa. And that successful story of investment cannot be made without functional institutions. You know. That's why we keep running into problems, like the US willingly says, OK, let's put $2 billion for solar energy. And then suddenly there is a problem of you know, monopoly and corruption there as well. Uh, not because it wants to get engaged in corruption. It's just because the whole system is built around corruption. Corruption is the institution that works in the country. And we really have to tackle that. So with China, the same. It would have been better for China if it built nicer roads, if the stadium had use. Uh, they had built one hospital that I had gifted. And the hospital collapsed uh, after um, less than a year of operations and had to be closed down and repaired for uh, some more years. So in that sense, corruption is also detrimental to good state relations, even to China. And um, that's why it's really important. It's key, especially for Angolans and for those who bear the brand of um, the consequences of corruption to address these institutional issues uh, so that there is a force within the country that actually can be um, a leverage also for the US, China, or any other country to really push for uh, reforms. Like at this point, uh, one other example that is happening is some of the assets that have been seized by the Angolan um, judicial authorities are now being trespassed or passed onto the hands of all the equally corrupt individuals. So it's just a transfer of ownership from one corrupt to another corrupt individual. That does not benefit the country. Um, so that's the nexus, basically. OK, we've um, really 
come to the end of our um, allotted time, but I would like to see if anyone would like to say something further, add something that you wanted to uh, articulate in this uh, in this session. It's not not a requirement, but is there anything else, Nate, you'd like to add? Uh, no, I'll spend my time back to Raphael, but I'll, I'll ask a, I'll ask a question if that's all right, if that's all right. Um, you said that the president needs to choose a, a foreign policy alignment of some kind, to some extent. Um, you know, be it China, or the U.S., or Europe, whoever he wants to do. To just choose and do do more dealings with, what is what is uh, how does the the Angolan public feel about all this? Um, you know, which way are they sort of because uh, you know Chinese investments as we've heard have often fallen literally fallen down. That they're, they're not the most popular. They're not as popular as they were right like ten years ago. But there is also across sub-Saharan Africa significant anti-Western sentiment. So how do these things balance out internally? Well, the worst for the public is to have a hybrid system no one understands. <laughs> if it's a dictatorship, it must be clear. <laughs> you know, if it's democracy, then we must go for it. Uh, so what we can't is one day we wake up and we're trying to be friends with the Americans. And then in the evening, we're welcoming Lavrov. So no one really understands what's going on because there is no clarity. Um, and the reason why there is no clarity is because the current uh, government of President Lorenzo has not actually crafted a vision for the country. So it's an improvisation that takes place every single day uh, in running the state affairs. And that makes people quite desperate because under the dictatorship, people knew how to deal with it and how to bypass the, the controls in a system where the judges try to be the main forces of the dictatorship you know, and not the military or the police, it becomes just too complicated for people to understand. Mm -hmm. Janae, any last words? Um, no, I don't think any final thoughts, though. I, I did want to say that I thought the article was wonderful. And thank you, Raphael, for your um, additions and Tom. Thank you, Jim. For the opportunity. Any final word, Raphael? Just a word of thanks to you for this opportunity, Tom. <laughs> OK, and thank you to our audience and our audience um, on, online. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.